So um, I was asked to talk about AI and the, the relevance with regards to the work that's going on inside of Ultra Ethernet Consortium as well as the SNEA organization. So I only brought one hat with me today, but you can consider it to be shared between the two different organizations of which I chair. So um, I was starting to go through this and figure out, OK, well, what can I talk at a developer conference that's actually going to wind up being useful for people, given the breadth of work that's going on in both organizations, as well as how deep can I go in 30 minutes? It's not going to wind up you know, uh, shortchanging something. So I hope I, had a, I struck a pretty decent balance. And I'd like this to get this to work. It doesn't. So we'll do, we'll do this old-fashioned way. There we go. Whatever reason it's not working. Okay. So um, basically, what I've decided to do is break it down into two different two different situations, or two different parts of the of the presentation. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the, the some of the requirements, the technical requirements of AI, and how they relate to changes that are necessary inside of the architectural infrastructure, and the work that's being done inside of Ultra Ethernet as well as inside of SNEA to address some of these changes. And then at the very end, I'm going to talk about how some of the future work is going to even have some uh, crossover and some uh, joint efforts that are are going to be useful. So, hey, it works. So we have kind of a bit of a chicken and the egg problem, right? Um, I, Gary started talking a little bit about this, this scale problem that we're trying to address, particularly when we start talking about the network infrastructure that has to be related to how big these AI systems wind up getting. AI is all about the data. Well, so is storage. So what a coincidence, right? But the question winds up being, how big does AI have to get before the networking architecture has to change to get the networking architecture to adjust for AI? It's that kind of... You know, uh, you know, chicken and egg problem. So when we start to deal with this, the first thing that people say, well, we've got to have really good speeds and feeds. Really good speeds and feeds. Yes. And then what? Like, once you get to the 1.6 terabit per second, then what? There's got to be more to it than that. And as it turns out, there is. There's a lot of things that go on once you start getting into these levels of speeds and feeds, even at the physical layer. You've got power issues. You've got scaling issues. You've got error rate issues. You've got a whole bunch of things that go on just at the physical level. However, when we start talking about AI and we start talking about the, the different types of processes that go on, the different types of workloads that happen, nobody's talking about bit error rates. They're talking about you know, uh, Gen M, Gen V, those kinds of things that require you know, multiple processing types and the data to move into different types of buffers. So when you start to get to that level, now we're start talking about storage, right? And when I say storage, I'm not talking about the capacity. Most of the people who are uh, outside of this room don't think of storage as anything other than the capacity, and that's the error that they make. Storage is data. Data how it gets where it goes, where it is, how it gets processed, where it gets processed, when it gets processed, excuse me, and so on. So as we start to figure out where the data needs to be and when, we have to start addressing those questions at each and every point in time. Is this the right place for it? How does it actually work? What are the changes that need to be made? And where are the pain points going to wind up being? So let's talk a little bit about the needs of AI. Now, as we've been speaking before, everything we've been talking about up until this point in time has implied one key thing, right? And that is, we are talking big, bloody numbers, right? You know, Gary's talking about exabytes, petabytes of RAM, and so on and so forth. And this is not unusual in the conversations that I deal with on a regular basis. When we're trying to talk about networking access, particularly Ethernet access, we are talking a minimum of a about a million nodes, a million endpoints for our fabric. Right now, there is no fabric. And I know, is John here, John Gilman here? John has a hissy fit every time you start talking about the word fabric. But when I'm talking about fabric, I'm using it in John's sense of the word, which means a really good understanding of all the different endpoints about the semantic aspects of how data is moved and transported and processed. And that's the question that we need to do at a million endpoints. If I have one watt of power increase per device, that's a million watt increase for my system, for my applications. That's a non-starter. So I need to be able to integrate whatever it is that I'm doing at the most efficient level, all the way from the physical layer all the way up into the storage uh, data processing layer. I have to get that synchronized. That is a problem that I have to solve. That is the problem that we have to solve, especially when we start talking about the AI workloads and how they get broken down into different processing types. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about moving forward is probably things that you're really, really familiar with. And I for, please forgive me for not going so far in depth that we're going to you know, uh, touch on the really, truly you know, 
juicy math, okay? Apologize for that, but that's not what this conversation is going to be about. But just know for the, for the sake of argument that as we start to get into these levels of scale, we get into bigger problems of time. Time becomes our enemy. Straggler data, the data that comes in at the end, the last bit back, that's our problem. In storage, we've had that problem for decades, right? Now we're starting to see that this is going to be an even bigger problem for these types of workloads. So we need dedicated storage, I'm sorry, dedicated <coughs> networks to be able to handle these kinds of particular problems. The other thing that's kind of important too is that we talk about latency as if it's only a matter of nanoseconds or milliseconds or microseconds. Obviously not in that order. So the question really is if we've got workloads that are going to be running for hours or days or in Gary's case weeks and months, we need to be able to be, uh, handle all of these kinds of uh, facets equally and uh, justifiably, right? You want to make sure that you don't wind up uh, going through bad, inefficient transport of data or data, work, um, data movement. The, uh, how many people are familiar with the term good put? You know what good put is? Okay, for those of you who aren't familiar with the word good put, good put is the ratio of work that's actually done compared to the amount of attempts it takes to make the work happen. If I have to retry on a network, that is not good put. So I want to make every single um, bit that goes across a wire count. The best I.O. is the one that never happens. And that's what we're trying to do both at the network level, the physical level, and at the storage level. So as we start to go through and say, take a look at some of the basic ideas of how AI um, processing works, uh, I'm going to break it down. And very, for those of you who are really familiar with this stuff, it's going to be high level. For those of you who are not familiar with it at all, it's going to seem really deep. So help, help work with me while I try to negotiate this. When we start talking about transformers and the, uh, the ability to create you know, the, the, uh, the chat GP text uh, and so on and so forth, what happens behind the scenes is you've got two basic processes and that have, well, come into what's called encoders and decoders. In a nutshell, the encoding is when you take all of the information that's coming in and you, uh, you identify the, the likely sequences of events that go on that, come in, um, that are, are the relationship between those. The, each of these different elements are called tokens, those tokens that are related and they're weighted based upon their relation to each other. And that weighting is what requires an awful lot of the data to be moved and held and, and processed and, and kept over. And it's very, very useful for GPUs to take this kind of parallel processing. The other part of it has to do with the creation of the text. And that's what the decoders do. That's what the, the chat GPTs do in the world, right? And the idea is that that is a sequential process. You, you kind of funnel the, funnel the weighted tokens down through, uh, through the, the chain till you actually get the next text in the word. And it's always sequential because you can only have one outcome, right? And so that's what we have to do inside of these kinds of, um, in these kinds of applications. Now the problem winds up being is that the data that you need to have when you need to have it is not the same. The data that exists inside of the world is not beautifully structured and therefore it needs to be cleaned and it needs to be processed. That comes into different data structures. Those different data structures have to be processed. What, what Gary was talking about with the computational storage is that it's easier to do that in situ, on the location of where the data winds up being, as opposed to moving it into a whole new petabyte system that winds up having to do nothing but restructure the data. It's easier to do it at the location. So when you start to combine these different stages, you wind up with two different diametrically opposite processing memory problems. And then as a result, you have different problems for networking. You have different semantics involved that have to be addressed to make sure that some of these pieces of, of um, processing have to be done in sequence and some of them can be done in parallel. These are not the same problems that have to be resolved. So when we start to ask ourselves, what are the things that are going to hurt when we start to try to do this? There's no one size fits all for this. Right? So as we start to go through these different kinds of constraints, especially when you start to hit that one million endpoint part, then you have to start realizing that, okay, if I do what I do now with networking, I'm not going to get to where I want to go. I'm not going to find the answers that I seek. Why? Because the current situation that we have in terms of networking and in terms of storage is designed specifically to create one-to-one -one relationships between our, our endpoints. That means that, for example, if we're using InfiniBand Verbs API, uh, the API for instance, we do, we, it can do multi-packet um, uh, process at a flowlet level, but that means that you wind up using inefficiency, uh, having inefficient problems for the use of the, of the network. Right? You can't do true packet spraying or multipathing with these kinds of environments. That means that some of the network is not fully utilized at the packet level. 
That's one of the problems that needs to be resolved. Another problem that needs to be resolved is that when you're talking about a million endpoints, you've got topology issues and you've got telemetry issues. What goes on inside the network? How do you know what's going on inside of the network? The other thing that problems when you, when you start to get to the rule of large lumber, numbers is you get an autopoiesis of congestion. In other words, you have a self-emergence of hotspots. This is a problem. So you have to have a combination of telemetry, congestion signaling, congestion notification, and congestion mitigation. The other thing that happens is that some of these tools require manual tuning. They have their own special sauce. They may be proprietary. And that means that you're going to have uh, the issue where you have specific hardware and software combinations to be able to handle some of these, uh, these workloads that are effectively manual. And that is very difficult to do when you start to get to really large endpoint times, even with scripting. right? So then you have what happens when things go wrong. How do I recover data that needs to be done? How do I recover data in flight that may have been lost? How do I recover uh, the processing that needs to happen? Now, these are well understood problems in storage that networking is still starting to get a hold of. Used to be that in networking, you be, or, or you know, have a, in the server world, you restart the VM, you're good to go. You can't really do that with an SSD. You can't really restart your SSD in the same, same fashion. Network is starting to understand that there are consequences to these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of events that have to be mitigated. Then you've got the issue of management. How do I manage a million endpoints? And when I say a million endpoints, I'm not talking about a server. I'm talking about a fabric endpoint, which could now be a port on a GPU. And my ports on the GPU could have 16, could have 128, could have 256 ports on a single GPU. Maybe not now, but certainly in the future. That's what we're talking about. Um, you know, we heard it at, at recent uh, you know, industry events. What about DPUs? What about the processing that goes on the DPUs? What about the processing of the fabric capabilities at these different elements, which ultimately used to be a single device? It used to be an Arnic. Now it's no longer just an ARNIC. Now it's an ARNIC inside of a DPU also processing NVMe over fabrics endpoints and distributing that inside of a, could be a CXL fabric inside of a server. What constitutes an endpoint has changed. What constitutes the processing of an endpoint has changed. And then last but not least, and certainly not least, is the security element. How do you get the security to work end to end in such a large environment? These are all questions that are going to hurt. So then we have the, uh, the basic problems that we have to try to solve, right? You've got the memory bandwidth, and you've got capacity, and you've got latency. All these different things are very important. And depending upon the workload, whether you're talking about transformative or sum sum uh, summarization uh, or generation, they've got different pain points for each of these different things. How do you negotiate these balances? So when we start to talk about um, you know, solving this problem, okay, I'll throw in a GPU here. I'll throw in a DPU here. Okay, well, I want to avoid the kernel, so I want to make sure I got the right um, memory buffer movement going on. Okay, well, these are all problems that are not exactly trivial at scale. What about your memory bound workloads? If you're processing a single word at a time, you can't necessarily put all the data and its metadata into a CP single GPU buffer zone. So you have to be able to accommodate that as well. So when you've got something like a recommendation workload, a recommendation workload for those who aren't in that context right now. It's like you go to Amazon and say, people like you bought this as well. That's a recommendation workload. That's 60% I.O., right, according to Meta. Um, so then you have the I.O. tax. If, if, you've got, if you've got all of these things that are moving around, 70% of your data is actually in process of being uh, flown around the network. You don't want that if you can avoid it. So how do, you, how do you make that happen? How do you know which data has to go there, and how do you know which data can stay here? These are the questions that have to be resolved. And then finally, um, you've got the, you got the I.O. Blender effect, which is anybody who's been involved in virtualization for any length of time knows how fun that is, right? So as we start to go through these processes and you want to, you want to checkpoint where these things are going, everything winds up being um, you know, a, a big, huge ball of twine. That worm monster that we're calling AI is more than just saying, I need to throw a GPU at the problem. And I work for AMD, and trust me, that, that statement has come up more than once, OK? So what are the impacts on the network? Well, I already talked a little bit about the Verbs API. And I said, um, I mentioned that when you start to talk, for, for one thing, there's no such thing as one um, RDMA technology. There's multiple RDMA technology. Verbs happens to be one of the most, uh, the most popular way of doing it, but there are other ways of doing it. So if you, if you take the Verbs API, one of the problems that you've got is that you have to go in order. You have to have in order delivery. But not every workload requires in order delivery for your network. 
So how do you know which ones are which? How do you make that happen? Well, that's a semantic question. Because the problem winds up being inside of this environment is that if you've got an, an in-order problem and you don't have the, the bits that you need, the packets don't come through, you have to go back n number of packets in order to get the full sequence again. That's not good put, that's bad put. Right? And that's the, one of the problems that we have, to, we have to do. Well, sometimes you need to have that kind of traffic, like control traffic has to be in sequence. But sometimes data doesn't have to be transmitted in sequence. That could be out of order traffic. How do you know which is which? You identify which is which at a different layer than the verbs API. That's one of the questions that we're trying to resolve over in UEC. So when that happens, every time you've got to retransmit something, especially in this kind of environment, you have the additional problem at the link layer because these types of things use priority flow control. Priority flow control was designed for a very specific purpose, and that is to inject congestion into the network. Right? That's what priority flow control does. It stops traffic on the link. That means that if you're not careful, if you create a network that has oversubscription problems, fan-in ratio problems, you're going to wind up with a head-of-line blocking uh, that goes all the way through the network, and nobody wants that, and it's one of the big downsides of priority flow control in these types of situations and environments. So you need a better way of handling congestion. Now, there's no, like I said, there's no magic bullet here. There's no perfect world in all of this. It's all about understanding the trade-offs. So when we start to talk about these different types of, of environments, you need to be able to understand which is which, right? So which part of the network is going to handle which part of the processing? That requires an intelligence that does not currently exist inside of the network. Why? Because as I pointed out earlier, you got to know the physical layer, you got to know the link layer, you got to know the transport layer, you got to know the software APIs. They all have to work in concert. No, no standard is designed to work in concert on a vertical level like that. It is designed to be stackable so that you don't have layer violations. That's what the networks are designed to do. UEC, on the other hand, has taken this question and said, well, are, we have a different problem. We've got workloads that are gonna be crossing these things across the board. They're called um, collectives, right? And so you can, uh, and you can also download the, uh, the, the presentation on the, uh, on the the registration site, by the way. So if you're taking screenshots, you're more than welcome to do so, but it is available on the website so you can download it. All right, these kinds of processes all right, are very, very common in HPC and AI uh, workloads because it all has to do with the nature of the endpoints communicating with one another. And it all has to do with how do you finally get that last bit back to be able to know the final answer that you're looking to, to accomplish. Anything that goes wrong at any one of these different layers can negatively affect the efficiency of that workload. That's what the things that we have to try to resolve. What about storage? Oh, storage. Storage, my old friend. Yes. As storage people, as, as you're my peeps, right? As my storage people you know already where I'm going with this, right? I got storage there, I gotta put it over here. I got storage over there, I gotta storage over there. I gotta hold this over here while I do something over here. I gotta do this in order to make absolutely sure that I don't lose my bits, right? That's bad, that's very bad. So we need to be absolutely sure that we've got the, at scale, that we don't lose the performance, that we're putting the, the, um, the storage where we need to go. There are all kinds of new creative buffers, bounce buffers, and everything going on specifically to handle all of this data being moved, specifically the metadata. We, um, Gary was talking about the, the you know, file systems and object storage, and, and uh, oh shoot, I forgot. Um, I was talking about block earlier today as well. Um, so all of these different things have different requirements at, the, at that level, right? So being able to do this at massive scale is going to be uh, absolutely critical. What about the, um, the different types of data that we're looking at? Where does it exist? Well, I mean, if you're AWS, what you consider to be an edge device is very different than what, um, you know, I don't know, some other, you know, Joe Schmo um, company is going to require as an edge device, right? You know, your, your phone is an edge device, right? A server could be an edge device. What constitutes an edge device? What's edge and core? What are the definition of terms here? How does that actually work? What about the multimodal jobs? What about the things like text versus video versus photographs? All the graphics that you see in here are AI generated, with the exception of, of the ones that I borrowed from the academic articles, which is like only one. Right? Everything else is AI generated. And so What's the different processes that go on behind the scenes between creating an image that is supposed to represent meaning in text and verbal text, which is actually put in, in the same thing? How, how does it, 
everybody I've spoken with about this, we don't actually know how the, how the uh, s summarization stuff that works. We just don't know how the weights, it, it just sort of self-emerges out of the data. And the larger the data, the more parameters that we have, one, you know, what's it, 1.4 trillion now for GPT-4? It's, 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 it's magic as for the as for way some people are thinking about it. But all of these things have, have um, you know, m every time you create more parameters, every time you tweak a knob, that requires I.O. So now we're talking about you know, um, multiple scales of, of just the I.O. itself. And then you've got the different specific features that go along with based upon which type of accelerator you're using for the types of, of processing you've got. If, if you're starting to get overwhelmed, now welcome to my world, okay? Because I'm doing with this at the, at the network level with UEC and I'm doing it at the storage level with SNEA, right? Because these are the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve in a holistic level. From a SNEA perspective, from SNEA's perspective, we already have a lot of work that we are being able to repurpose. Right? We, for instance, we've got, we've got the programming models for persistent memory. The power element is one of those uh, parts that is absolutely critical for understanding in really large scale systems. So the Emerald program is critical. We've got the, um, the, uh, the security standards that have been recently updated. Thank you, Eric, um, and the security twig. Uh, we've got, we've got uh, I, I left automotive storage here because it's a brand new thing where, where AI is starting to become a an interesting component for storage. SNEA does not have active projects in this development, but is one that we're, we're seriously and significantly looking at. And then, of course, we've got the computational storage stuff that was uh, talked about a couple times before. And then, um, last but not least, and I'm really this is one that I'm really kind of excited to talk about, is a smart data accelerator interface. And SDXI is a data mover that allows you to be able to do some of these processing inside of memory, which is actually very cool. So when we start talking about memory infrastructures, about we're talking about the data, and and uh, and, and both Adam um, and uh, I'm sorry, a a Andy and Adam were talking about the fact that um, memory and storage are colliding, right? We know that this is the case. We know that memory and storage are colliding. What type of data you're getting, where it's going to be, can be treated relatively similarly in, in the concept of of scope. Right? So as we start to go through the concept of, of memory, like a, a computational fabric attached memory, all the CXL discussions that were happening earlier, um, I thought that Kevin did a really good job of, of piecing together the, the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches. Um, you know, hierarchical memory pooling, the different networking endpoints and what actually happens when, how do you control and manage the different uh, processing types and identify them with specific namespaces on an NVMe basis and so on. Uh, some of the work that we're doing with regards to um, uh, computational storage and, and SLM and CXL is actually kind of interesting. These are all processes that are working both in, working in conjunction with these other organizations. It's not just SNEA. And then we've got some low-level efficiency improvements as well, which helps reduce that cost basis for, for power. You've got the, you know, the in-process data mutation like SCXI is not just a data mover. It has the ability to, to change and, and, and modify the data between different uh, memory registers. And I highly recommend that you watch uh, Sham's uh, recent presentations on, on how they do that in SCXI. It's, it's, we've got it on SNEA video and YouTube. Right? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about, it, about what we can possibly do as we, we move forward in the future. But the idea here is that if I've got a data mover that's using the hardware components that does not have to go into I.O., I have just saved myself that I.O. And what did I say was the best I.O.? It's the one that you don't have to use. Right? So here's an example. Now, this is not available right now. It's not possible to do this right now. But this is where we're going. This was always part of the design of what we're looking to do. When you need to move pro data inside of a, a GPU, for instance, think about all the different places that it has to hit, all the different buffers it has to hit, right? Once you start to realize that that's the, that's the need, you start, and then you're piecing together all the different places where the processing can happen, it becomes a lot to deal with. But if it's all part of the same access within inside of a GPU, now one of the problems winds up being is, what if the data is not the kind of structure that you need? How do I modify it? Right? So now the data has to be cleaned, it has to be prepped, it has to be put inside of a structure, and this is particularly a problem if you've got a proprietary unicorn kind of environment. So the, the prime case for computational storage to have that data inside of the end device itself. And if you're going to mutate that data, you could do it using SDXI through the memory movement from, from one location inside of memory to another location inside of memory by being able to adjust the different types of data structures 
in transit. Now, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over a lot of stuff here, and there's, I mean, I'm, I'm, trying, to come, I'm pr trying to compress 90 minutes of SDXI down into 90 seconds. So you'll have to bear with me, and I do, uh, like I said, I do highly recommend that you, you, you look at, um, at Sham's presentation about that. But the idea here is that all of these, typical, all of these things generally require an I.O. They require movement between different processing devices. And we want to avoid that. So if we can do this with a, a, a processor agnostic um, software-based data mover engine that actually has the ability to mutate between memory registers, you have just saved a lot of data movement. Because all of those data buffers that actually wind up existing um, between, between devices now don't have to exist at all. Very, very cool. So it's a matter of, it's, a, it's an ability to normalize the memory over time with regards to the, the data processing and data, data structures and that winds up being highly programmable, right? And it's inherently secure to begin with because of the nature of the way that these run on privileged processes. Right? Now, obviously, you know, there's always improvements and we're working on it and, and I'm going to go to a little pitch here for SNEA. If you would like to join and participate and learn more about it, I highly recommend that you do that. We're also friendly people. We've got nice slippers. All right, so this, this diagram, all this diagram here is, is designed to show you is how much data movement exists and how much data movement you can actually reduce by being able to use the proper tools for the proper jobs. Right? And I want to thank Jason for this because of the fact that he did a phenomenal job doing this and I didn't have to. <laughs> so, um, but the idea here is that we, we don't want to, we don't have a lot of tromboning. Tromboning is one of my favorite words to deal with when we have to deal with data moving from one place to another and back again. So if we can avoid the tromboning and we can do all the data processing that we need to in situ, the better we're off we're going to be. So what's the road ahead? Ultra Ethernet takes on the responsibility of the full stack. Right? Everything from the, the physical layer all the way up into the software APIs to, to uh, handle this, it deals with the semantic layer and the transport to be able to identify the types of traffic that require reliable order delivery, unordered delivery, um, and so on. Uh, it, it also deals with a, the vertical thread of management, storage, compliance, and performance. So it is the first organization that is designed specifically to create workload-tuned networks for um, for both reliable and unreliable uh, data traffic types. And that's what Ultra Ether, it's a very ambitious project, right? So we've gone from six companies to 70 companies in less than half a year. And so it's, it's got a lot of work um, that we're doing designed specifically to address some of the limitations in existing uh, traditional high performance computing and AI types of networks. And we anticipate a, a 1.0 specification probably towards the end of 2024. I think it's a realistic goal. Now, what about SNEA? Well, we've already talked a bit about the, the SNEA standards. We've got, um, if, you've, if you're familiar with SNEA, then you know most of these already. But what we have not done inside of SNEA, and one of the things that as chair I'm going to try to, to make sure that we do as a next step, is to tie these things together for workload-specific um, capabilities. AI is obviously the, the, the primary one because it's the purpose of the talk. But the idea here is that we don't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel. We want to take the, the, the tools that we've got, we want to take the work that we've got, and we want to purpose it to, to a bigger service. And that's what SNEA is going to be doing over the next couple of years. And as a result, it's going to have a critical component for solving some of the problems that networking folks and software folks haven't been able to address because that's just not their world. The storage world is different than the software world for, you know, for containers and, and it's different from the networking world. How many times has somebody said, well, we just do, you know, we do the hard work, it's just the storage guys have to hold on to our bits for us. Nobody? Nobody's had that heard? Anybody said it? Okay, I've heard it said. A lot. We take care of those people. That's right. Hey, we, they don't bother us anymore. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion, and I know I'm out of time, um, the, it really can't be stressed enough that the margin for error for the work that's going on inside of AI and HPC workloads, right, is leaving very little room for, um, there's no wiggles, no wiggle room, right? Um, and this gets worse the faster the links go. The faster the links go, the worse the margin for error is. And so we need to be able to process these things because um, everything from you know, the, the, the signal rate and the power that comes in on the end devices and you know, SNEA works with, uh, you know, the, the SFF does endpoint devices and hardware 
And so we are very in integrated and involved in these kinds of problems. All the way up into the software APIs and the management structure for which Redfish and Swordfish is, uh, is all part of it. And all points in between have to be handled, not to mention the data transfer that goes across. It's very critical to understand that there is no one way, uh, no one organization that could ever do this. And it's going to require the, the combination of um, more than just SNEA, more than just UEC, but it's also going to require a lot of voices to come and join on both sides to be able to handle this out. So that's me. My name is Jay Metz. I am the chair of both organizations. And I want to thank you very much. And I'll answer any questions you've got. Can Damn always, it! You can always count on me. <laughs> um, Going to show my age, but. There's an awful lot of string copy, string compare running in application in machines today. <laughs> um, you think the this off this movement offload engine will pervade even at that level? Um, that's a good question, Sham. What do you think? Yes to, my, yes to all. Yeah, okay. Yes to all of those. And that's, that's one of the reasons the proof was done. So, how long does it take to get the the GNU community to be wonderful and happy. <laughs> I'm noticing the limitation of one microphone per room. <laughs> so, yeah, so the specification came out end of 22, and the software group started, I think, late last year. And um, we are in the process of getting a library out which will help start all of those software integrations with open source communities, GNU's, and things of that nature. So it's absolutely the right place to get uh, plugged in, to get uh, all those software integrations there. <laughs> you, you need to float around. And <laughs> so um, is there any scatter gatherer ish kinds of things? I think you should be in the working group. We had just two days. We had two days of um, SDXI meetings uh, yesterday and the day before. Uh, and one of the topics was scatter gather. The 1.0 specification doesn't include scatter gather for virtual addresses. If you have physically scattered addresses, you can still do scatter gather because it requires the spec requires IOMMU and IOMMU collects all of them. Uh, for virtually scattered uh, addresses, we are working on it for the next specification revision. Um, so the user virtual addresses, um, if they are scattered, then we need a scatter gather uh, primitive. But we're, we're working on that. And I do think uh, I may have uh, tripped into Galen's uh, presentation at MEMCON. So that's one another, uh, um, you know, uh, I would say motive to look at that. John and, and then uh, Peter. No, nope, John first and then Peter. So one, one thing that I uh, stepped away to go play with today was a um, discussion for, uh, which has happened in a couple of places, of entities, storage entities, which might involve large amounts of, of RAM and, per, and persistent storage and in particular for desktop and mobile applications. And when I've listened to what you've had to say and Andy had to say and all this other stuff, it's really focused on the large hyperscaler problem. We should probably also, when we're wearing our SNEA hats, be thinking about the automotive mobile desktop AI incursion also and what, what we need to be doing in that space. What a coincidence. Remember the bullet? <laughs> it was actually a bullet up there. So th thank, thank you for reading my mind. That was great. Jay, maybe this is an offline topic, but um, I'm wondering what the trade-offs and how they're changing between doing you know predictable good put reduction like forward error correction as opposed to you know retries and retransmits of packets. Or is that something you're looking at, and do you see that being something that's tunable or? So, so the, the issue, is the, the question about solving the, um, primarily at the physical layer, right, the errors, right, the physical layer. Um, 
the, you can you can solve errors at the transmission level with congestion signaling, congestion notification issues. And what we've got inside of UEC is a, a receiver, a sender and receiver based um, uh, combination that allows you to do packet flow level at, at all, using all um, all links. At the physical layer, the question is a little bit more complex because of the fact that that. Ultra Ethernet doesn't have all of the Ethernet physical components, right? That's, that's IEEE 802.3. Uh, and so what we've got at that point is a, is a working relationship with, with IEEE of a liaison to talk about the work that we need to do that would probably um, you know, be transposed into there. Then the question winds up being, how do you handle that at the semantic layer, at the transport layer, moving back up the stack? And that's where the, um, the congestion notification is handled based upon semantics as well. And there's an API for uh, for that sitting on top of it. So it's it, it is an integrated process, and, and it's all part of the way that Ultra Ethernet is designed to uh, cross pollinate those ideas and make sure that they're going to be aligned vertically. But um, I have to be careful about how much I talk about it, not only because I'm out of time, but because of the fact that it's not released yet and it's still technically confidential. <laughs>